Thank you very much. For those of you that are returning from yesterday's, or from Friday's presentation, this is take two, and we will move very quickly through the material because I don't want to repeat for you that have been here the same material over. We'll skim through it quickly. But for the benefit of our uh, streaming audience that's watching this program, um, I apologize that it's going to go quickly, but we need to get to the point. There was a reason why the files were deleted from a remote camera and a camera back here that's broadcast quality. So we're going to get to the meat of the issue as quickly as we can as to the subject that I believe they did not want me to be speaking about. Okay, And that's primarily dealing with the D-Wave adiabatic quantum computer. Okay, We've pretty much figured out why they didn't like me yesterday. So with that said, we will cover some about CERN. The majority, as I said, will be about D-Wave's quantum computer. We'll touch on the sentient world simulation again. And we'll probably go right on by the, D the DNA. Unless you want me to, I'm going to have you guys tell me what you would like to hear. Okay, so we'll do some DNA. Nanoparticles, third strand of DNA. But there's new information since Friday. In fact, since last night. And I'm going to share it with you today related to the computers that I was not even aware of. And it's two parts. Before I went to bed last night, I was praying, and the Lord gave me some information. Now, I'm not a prophet. You guys know that. It's just, you know, that constant conversation. Um, when I got up this morning, there was another message for me. It wasn't on the phone. And that I'll share with you as well, because the one I got this morning, I had no clue. No clue about. I think what happened with the Friday presentation was God's sense of humor that I always talk about. Because what I'm going to share with you today that I didn't on Friday is where he went, mm -mm. you didn't get it all out. So we're going to redo it. So you will get it right this time. Okay. So let's start with Gordy Rose, one of the founders of D-Wave Corporation's quantum computers. This is about a 10-minute clip. It gives you a good backstory of what we're going to talk about. There's some key phrases in here I want you to pay attention to that are on my website at anthonypatch.com at the Urgent Discoveries tab. The quotes on my website are taken from this video. Um, it'll go through the model numbers, but those are even obsolete and dated compared to what I'm going to give you today. We're going to go from the graduate level, like I said on Friday, to the postgraduate level today. So this is new stuff, and you guys are kind enough to listen to me and let me present my thoughts to you. Thank you, sir. So, we'll see how the technology works. Where's Paul Begley? You guys know his history, Paul Begley technology? I might need his help. All right, let's see how it goes. Uh, I'm going to tell you a crazy but true story uh, about the nature of your universe. Um, so, you may have heard this word quantum computing. Uh, it's often people have the misconception that it's some kind of newfangled supercomputer. It's decidedly not that. Um, quantum computers allow us to access hidden features of nature, new dimensions, and if we can access these sort of hidden dimensions uh, at scale, we could have unimaginable computing power.
one is really exciting to me. Because what they're going to do is apply this machine to an area that I think is fundamentally important. It's the crux of our future as humans. And that's, can we build machines like us? Fridges, interestingly enough, which are called pulse tube dilution refrigerators, have a thing called a pulse tube, which emits a sound roughly once per second, which sounds eerily like a heartbeat. So if you're sta you have the opportunity to stand next to one of these machines, it is an awe-inspiring thing, at least for me. It feels like an altar to an alien god. It, they really are impressive machines. At the heart of this big box is a tiny chip about the size of your thumbnail. And on this chip resides all of the wonder and magic that makes this thing go. I'm not going to describe in any mathematical detail how it all works, but let me give you an analogy. In quantum mechanics, there's this concept that an, an, a, a thing can exist in two states which are mutually exclusive, at the same time, quote unquote. So I'm using those words because the English language was developed before we had concepts to describe what these things actually are doing. But I'm gonna give you a, a, a roundabout way of understanding this. Imagine that there really are parallel universes out there, and now imagine you have two that are exactly identical in every respect, all the way out to the horizon, as far as we can see, down to the last little atomic detail of every single thing with only one difference. And that's the value of a little thing called a qubit on this chip, which is the contraction of quantum bit. And that qubit is very much like a bit or a transistor in a conventional computer. It has two distinct physical states, which we call zero and one for bit. In a conventional computer, these are mutually exclusive. That device is either one or the other, and never anything else. In a quantum computer, that device can be in this strange situation where these two parallel universes have a nexus, a point in space where they overlap. And when you increase the number of these devices, you, every time you add one of these qubits, you double the number of these parallel universes that you have access to until such time when you get to a chip like this, which is about 500 of these bits, you have something like two to the 500th power of these guys living in that chip. 
So the way I think about it is that the shadows of these parallel worlds overlap with ours. And if we're smart enough, we can dive into them and grab their resources and pull them back into ours to make an effect in our world. Now, this may sound very odd to you and bizarre, and in fact, I am using language that a normal theoretical physicist probably wouldn't use, but this is, what I'm telling you is absolutely correct and in line with the way that these things actually work. We've been doing this for some time now, and in fact, we have our own version of Moore's Law. The doubling uh, of the number of these qubits on the chip has happened once a year for the past nine years. So for the last nine years, every year, the number of these qubit devices has doubled, and it will continue to do so. This was recorded, the original video, in 2013. He's talking about doubling the number of qubits every 12 months. That's called Rose's Law, after Gordy Rose. Rose's Law has been replaced by a doubling of qubits every 12 months to a doubling of qubits every three months by their own words. This was recorded in 2013. At that time, the Model 512 computer was released. So what I'm going to give to you are numbers significantly higher than 512. Numbers that they have not even released. It's simply mathematics. Okay? The reason I'm starting with this is because I want to dissect some of what he's talking about randomly. Resources. Parallel dimensions. An altar to an alien god. Eerily like a heartbeat. This is artificial intelligence. This is beyond simple machine learning. This is spiritually influenced. You cannot separate the physical from the spiritual, and vice versa. We have a problem here. It's not my computer this time. I define the resources as two things that they're extra extracting from parallel universes. Energy, they put in 100% energy when they're inserting a combinatorial problem or program. And they're receiving back, they're extracting resources in the form of 110% energy. They're getting back 10% more than they put in into our reality. That's why I call this revising reality. They're also receiving solutions that have a 99% accuracy. So the coherence of the system is stable. In fact, they leverage decoherence, which typically produces errors in computers. But they've leveraged it. So let's talk about parallel dimensions. That's something that a lot of people key in on. This is an interdimensional computer. This is opening at the quantum scale interdimensional portals. Now he cited with the Model 512 in 2013 that they were accessing 2 to the 500th power. So he's taking 512 and sort of abbreviating. We can't even conceptualize that size of a number. I'm going to put up a couple of slides to help us look at some numbers, but that's not the focus today is numbers. It's just the fact that it's operating interdimensionally. Now this video was produced by Nicholson 1968, a good friend of mine, that compilation. I commend him for that. But he included CERN in this, in the discussion of D-Wave's computer. The reason is this computer will be responsible for opening the large scale, what I call the freeway portal at CERN and maintaining the expansion and growth of that and then the stabilization of a macro scale portal. CERN's own people have openly said, we are going to open a portal. We're going to open a gateway, a doorway. So this isn't me talking science fiction. I'm reporting to you from the source. So think of me as a reporter today. Okay? 
Let's see if I can get this going. Hmm? I have a remote. Yeah. I'm just trying to get back to square one. Yeah. I think it'll run. Give me a hand with that. Good. But right there would be great. Yeah, let's. Okay, we're going to skip through here real quickly. As I said, we're not really going in order today because of what happened yesterday. Let me give thanks here to the people that are responsible for the information I'm presenting to you. Yeah, right there would be great. That's it. Good. We're good. Okay. All of these people have contributed to my research. We're close friends. We produce videos on YouTube. You may have heard me interviewed on many of their shows. These people are diehard Christians, warriors. They're doing their own research in their own areas and putting out information. So I'm reflecting them and I want to give thanks to them as to what they've done. Out of this door might come something, or we might send something through it," said Sergio Bertolucci, Director for Research and Scientific Computing at CERN. They're not playing games. They're deadly serious about it, and I mean deadly. Revelation 9. CERN is located over the doorway to the abyss, the ancient Roman temple to Apollo, Apollyon, Abaddon, the destroyer. Okay? Again, the audience here, for the benefit of the streaming audience, the audience here has heard all of this before on Friday. So we're going to move right on through. I'm going to get back to D-Wave here very quickly. Hopefully. The Model 512 computer that was discussed in this video is ancient history. In 2015, they announced the 1024 model of computer. They just announced last week that next year they will release one that has over 2,000 qubits. That's the 2048 model. They're not calling it the 2048. Not openly. They're simply calling it a 2,000 qubit. I'm here to give you the accurate information as to what's going on. I apologize that we're having to go this way, but it's the only way I can shortcut things here. Come on. Now, Gordy was talking about standing at the altar to an alien god. So for the benefit of the audience here, has anybody ever heard a physicist or a computer scientist speak that way or make a reference like that? No. So why would he even choose that? He's talking to a scientific audience. Why would he choose a word, which obviously he prepared a speech, why would he choose a word or a phrase like that, unless he was telegraphing a message. And a pulse dilution refrigerator, I'll define that in a moment. But he's talking about, it sounds like a heartbeat. He's talking about artificial intelligence and sentient self-awareness. He's talking about a living and breathing computer. That sounds far-fetched. But I think we're going to demonstrate just how real this is today. This is what the inside of this computer looks like. That's a black cube. You guys heard me talk about it on Friday, the worship of the black cube in Saturn, the black sun. 
Okay? They chose the color and shape for a reason. This is electromagnetic shielding. It's also thermal shielding. This is a computer that is super cold, colder than outer space for superconducting purposes. The chip has what are known as Josephson junctions to establish quantum entanglement at the quantum level. That's what Einstein called spooky action at a distance, quantum entanglement. That's what makes it work. But they have to have the chip and the conductors cold enough that they can eliminate resistance so that the electrons can flow freely in the qubit and also maintain that quantum state and the quantum entanglement that allows it to communicate through what's called quantum tunneling, Gothard tunnel, quantum tunneling. Gothard tunnel right near CERN, okay? They're showing you how they're opening the portal in the ceremony at the Gothard Tunnel. They show you the portal on the screen. It's a tunnel, and you use quantum tunneling to talk to the other side. So they're telling us straight out. So, super cold, shielded from electromagnetic interference from the outside. That maintains the quantum entanglement and it maintains the um, superconducting state. This is what it looks like. Do you remember the movie, or the, I guess it was a movie, Star Trek movie, and the woman and her spine that was lowered, head and spine, down into the body? Now I'm going to share something with you today that I didn't on Friday. This is the this is the qubit itself in an armature. That's what it looks like you saw it in the video. What you're seeing here is not the real computer. This is for public consumption. I'll tell you what it is a little bit later. But this is not the real computer. This is the Model T compared to what they're really doing. So, this is all for, you know, show. Things are a little slow here today, I'm sorry. <laughs> Tell you what, go ahead and cut the PowerPoint all together and we're just going to go right off the top of the bald head, okay? I'm not going to play games with this thing today. This, hap this happened in Colorado in June when I was presenting. Two separate presentations, two days, both days, same thing happened that you just saw, okay? Anyway, point here is D-Wave's computer the latest model was the 1024. Now they've gone to a 4098. What we're talking about here is the power of two. Basic math, the power of two. 4098 is what results when you take two and multiply it times 1024. You take 2048 and you multiply it by two. You get 4096, and then you get 8192. In the power of 2, 8192, a new number that I'm giving you, is 2 to the 13th power. 2048 is 2 to the 11th. In between is 4096, if I've got my number straight without my notes, is 2 to the 11th power. This is binary progression. This is basic and software programming, the power of 2. That's why their model numbers advance that way. But the 8192, let's go to old school. Maybe we'll take a break and we'll regroup and get the computer going here if we can. But I shared with you what is called a 600 cell tetrahedron on Friday. This is what the 8192 computer looks like now. 
If you guys on AV, if you want to come up and play with my laptop and see if you can get it going again, because I will need some pictures. Here's the deal. We've got an 8192 that's in the shape of a 600-cell tetrahedron. Tetrahedron is a pyramid, but with a triangular base, not a square base like you see in Egypt. Back in early 2012, late 2015, or 13, I read a um, paper by Buckminster Fuller, a biography of Buckminster Fuller, and he was talking about tetrahedrons. And he said that the simplest form or simplest shape that can enclose a volume is a tetrahedron. And when I read that, I thought, oh, singularity, Big Bang. Now, I don't adhere to the Big Bang theory. I have my own that I'm going to share with you. But the real issue is, if the singularity did exist, and Buckminster Fuller, who people know from the geodesic dome, and Bucky Balls, Bucky Fullerenes, Bucky Tubes, C60 Carbon, if he, as a brilliant researcher, comes up with a tetrahedron as the simplest form, then if there is a singularity, a point of origin to the universe, it took the shape of a tetrahedron. Now the reason this is relevant to the discussion of D-Wave Corporation's computers is that I had published both my books, my first two books, and interestingly enough, I find out after the fact that computer scientists and physicists were publishing papers about how to arrange qubits in a tetrahedral arrangement to build a quantum computer, which are already in my published novels. I wonder if they read it on the cloud. Okay? It's, I'm not trying to build myself up. This is just the synchronicities of what God does. It's really strange. So if we get the PowerPoint going, I'll jump around and try to get to the pictures of the 600 cell. But here's kind of the punchline. And there's more to add, but the punchline. If, in fact, my intuition, download from God, whatever you want to call it, creative imagination, if, in fact, the 8192 computer exists, that's 2 to the 8,000th power of parallel dimensions, according to Gordy Rose's formula, that they're accessing. And it's arranged in a tetrahedral shape, comprising a sphere. Then they have just built a quantum computer that is identical to my model of the universe which is freaky. That's what's on my bag, the 600-cell tetrahedron. When I first saw that, I thought, wow, that answers Buckminster Fuller's conjecture about a single tetrahedron. So how do you get from a single to that? It's not a big bang. It's a replication. Example, nano-diamonds, which is what I built my computer out of. Nano diamonds of C60 carbon, Buckminster Fuller, self replicate in the laboratory. You can start it with a microwave, thank you, microwave signal to a nano diamond, or you can use a laser, a pulsed frequency laser. Let's see what happens here. So, thank you guys, appreciate the backup. Alrighty. I'll leave that up for a moment. You can look at it. We already covered it. If they have a computer that models the universe, which is self-replicating, expanding outward, unidirectionally, tetrahedrons, then they're modeling how the universe operates. Pretty much the ultimate computer. If they're building it, 
for opening a portal, it pretty much is the ultimate because that's going to be the end of us. Interestingly enough, the power of 2 to the 13th power resulting in 8192 also relates to the octave range. Now, there are about a dozen relationships like this that coincide with the model numbers of D-Wave's computers, but I'm not going to go through all those today. But you see the same numbers here, 1024, 2048, 4096. If you have a diamond crystal that resonates at 4096, which it does, supposedly, in the New Age way of thinking, it opens doorways to angelic kingdoms. I do believe D-Wave is connected to CERN because they're talking the same way, the same language, the same goals, the same mathematics, the same physics. The physics part of this model of the universe I'll briefly get to if the slides cooperate with us because it's, um, it's rather interesting. Boy. Come on, here we go. All righty. If you take 2 to the 4096th power, one of the computer model numbers, and you have a resulting number that's 1,234 digits in length, you reduce that down to its decimal approximation of 1.044. That's almost the same as the background radiation wavelength of the universe. If they're modeling the computer after the model, the tetrahedral process of the universe, they're tuning it, literally, to the wavelength of the universe. If you're going to communicate, you want to tune things, right? The computer is tuned to the pulse of the universe, to the heartbeat, Gordy Rose. It sounds like a heartbeat. And then he talks about it's like standing at the altar to an alien god. They're communicating to alien gods. And those of us that understand the Bible understand the ramifications of what I just said. And there's a little bit more, okay? Again, 2 to the 500th power, when they had the model 512, they were not at the proper frequency and wavelength. So they had to progress the model numbers. So here's what they did. They kept building more complex computers, added the qubits mathematically in a binary fashion towards that goal to get it tuned. The 4096 tuned into the universe. That's where they were actually able to communicate real time, 24-7, stable portal at the quantum level. Same thing they're going to do at CERN, but on a macro scale. Revelation 9. They're ready. The 8192, the number runs out to infinity. Most computers won't process a number like 2 to the 8192 power. It'll just come up infinity. Okay? There we are. So if my conjecture is correct, this is what the computer looks like. This is a freeze frame of the universe expanding through the spontaneous replication of tetrahedrons. Tetrahedrons at the atomic level, according to science, when they are cooled, to a superconducting level, they comprise one tetrahedron. When they begin to heat them, add energy to them, to the basic elements, 
What do you think they do? They replicate geometrically into more and more complex geometric shapes, all of which are subsets of this, until they finally reach this figure. And it goes beyond this. This is a snapshot. An interruption of that replication is what you're seeing. When you go to the cosmological level and you look at galaxies, this is all straight from their papers. This isn't me. They see C60 carbon, buckyball, buckyfullerenes on the macro scale in the cosmos exactly as they see at the atomic level, as above, so below. The same pattern of tetrahedrons in the cosmos as they see under the microscope. Now that's pretty wild. That's not the Big Bang. Complete departure. Nano diamonds along with other particles, but I'm focused on nano diamonds in my books, self-replicate. You can also store data, voids in the crystals, okay? Nitrogen-filled voids, use a laser, you pulse digital information, binary information, it's stored and captured, stable for the life of the diamond. That data is remain intact, unchanged. That's what this computer does. Now this made me fall out of my chair. This is going to be technical, but I told you this is the postgraduate level. Friday was the graduate level. Today we're getting pretty deep. And if the audience that's watching is tuned out already, oh well. You guys get to hear it. Okay? But here we go. This is a published paper. I say I get all my research right from them. And this is going to show you what I look at on a regular basis. You notice the guy's name is Tony? Synchronicities. This document you're going to see just snippets of came right off the CERN, CERN's server. I'm going to show you again that the computer is connected to CERN. I'm going to show you the proof mathematically that my model of the universe is valid. Okay? E8 refers to the number of dimensions. Clifford 16 refers to dimensions and spatial locations. Lagrangian is a form of spatial orientation, locating things graphically. The algebraic quantum field theory, AQFT, it's a mouthful. That just described that 600 cell tetrahedron. The fundamental mass scale vacuum expectation value V of the Higgs scalar field is the fundamental mass parameter. That is to be set to define all other masses by the mass ratio formulas of the model and gobbledygook, gobbledygook, all the way along. Okay, GEV, that's um, giga electron volts. CERN talks about tera electron volts. And I talk about peta electron volts. Okay? What this is describing to you is the Higgs boson, the, the so-called God particle. This 600 cell tetrahedron model has everything to do with CERN and particles and particle collisions and energy derived from those collisions throughout this 125 page published peer reviewed paper. Published in 2014 six months after my second book was published, describing exactly what is in this paper. And I am not a physicist, nor a mathematician, okay? This is God working through me. It doesn't make me special. He just sends the information through. So I'm just witnessing here.
In the model of the 600 cell tetrahedron, the connecting lines I describe as carbon nanotubes, C60 carbon, buckyball fullerene connections. Each one of the dots is a qubit. As I said, the science paper that described that arrangement of putting the qubits in tetrahedrons. This material in this paper, BISCO, this is the material they use to construct those connecting lines, different than my use of C60 carbon. Not a big deal. But I'm just showing you the actual description that they're using in this paper. So configure the JJ array. JJ is Josephson, Josephson junctions. I mentioned that in D-Wave's qubits. Super cold, super conducting, connections by Josephson junction, junctions. That produces the quantum state for quantum entanglement. This guy's talking about a geometric shape, a 600 cell tetrahedron. So here it is again, in the paper, the simplest polytope, which is a arrangement of tetrahedrons. Superconducting tetrahedral quantum bits. Buckminster Fuller, simplest form, singularity, beginning of the universe. The qubit design emulates a spin half system in vanishing magnetic field, the ideal starting point construction of a qubit. He's talking about building a quantum computer. He's talking also later how particles interact in the universe and how they interact at the Large Hadron Collider. He cites the Large Hadron Collider in here. He talks about what they are going to realize in 2015 and 2016. He's talking about the computer that they are using at CERN, and it's the 600 cell tetrahedron, and he doesn't even know it. He connects it to CERN, but he doesn't realize that what he's talking about is the model of the universe. A brilliant mathematician working with CERN, worked with Los Alamos, his archives of his other published works are archived at Los Alamos. Okay? This is a heavy hitter that we're talking about here. Manipulation of the tetrahedral qubit through external bias signals translates into application magnetic fields on the spin. The application of the bias to different elements of the tetrahedral qubit corresponds to rotated operations in spin space. What that means is particles spin. They have mass and they have movement and trajectory. You can use primarily the spin to impart ones and zeros, binary information. Use it as a processor. The spin of quantum particles. Now I'm abbreviating this, but again, this is the replication. You start with one, you go to two, and you get this. I have no doubt in my mind that this computer exists. That's a long way from 512 and 2013 where they're doubling the number of qubits every three months, not every 12, according to Gordy Rose's own law. It's not a great leap in mathematics or in time to say what I'm saying is accurate about what they're hiding from us. There's a concept in, in our discussion of technology that technology that we're aware of today is already 30, 40, 50 years old. I'm showing you an example of that, okay? Now, I promised another piece of bonus information. This came to me this morning. I have a little cable drawn in there just to represent quantum entanglement. There are multiple models. You remember the numbers I showed you of the octaves and the power of two running all the way down through the model numbers. The model numbers walk lockstep with the octaves and the power of two. There's a reason behind that and I showed you it was getting to the point 
of tuning the computer to the wavelength of the universe, specifically the background wavelength, the background microwave radiation wavelength to the universe. So it's tuned, and it's built, and it's operating, and they're ready. They're waiting for the restrainer to be removed. It's the only thing holding them back. This is what's relevant to Bible prophecy in our lives. The restrainer is the only thing. Here's the new piece of information that was given to me when I awoken, awakened this morning. If you have a computer that operates in a, by way of quantum entanglement, and I'll define that in just a second for you. I'm kind of working backwards. If you have one computer operating with quantum entanglement and you build another one all the way through the model numbers and they're all quantum entangled individually, what do you think is going to happen when you get to the 8192 and it's tuned to the universe and it's artificially intelligent and it's self-aware, it's sentient. Is it going to be compatible with the older generation of computers? How many of you have phones for the last three or four years that had Siri and the other artificially intelligent applications? My good friend Richie from Boston, great YouTube channel, videotaping over here. He's been my He's been covering my six. Those of you in, that are veterans know what covering your six is. He literally has been doing that because of the stuff that's been going on the last couple of days. Anyway, he shared with me, and I didn't know this, but that application, if you take two phones and hold them up face to face and let them talk to one another, you have two artificially intelligent phones speaking to one another. And according to Richie, maybe you've tried this, they start getting pissed off. They get mad at each other. And they start to argue. And what's the last thing, Richie, that they do? They talk. They lie. They lie. They want to know who created them, and they start talking about God. Two artificially intelligent computers are arguing and then asking, who created me, and what is God? Now, I haven't run the experiment. Maybe you guys have. Richie says he has. People at home are probably grabbing their wife and their husband's phones and trying to figure out, do these things really do that? Is that why we argue as husband and wife? I don't know. But here's the punchline. If you have artificially intelligent quantum computers accessing thousands of parallel dimensions at the same time, and the goal is to open a portal, do you want them to get along? You want them to be compatible. So you do a little marriage counseling, right? If they operate independently and artificially intelligent and they're quantum entangled in their own little cube, to get them to cooperate with each other, you have to network them. You have to quantum entangle every single model of computer. And when this hit me this morning, I was like, oh my goodness may not mean much to you guys because you don't have the benefit of the research that I've done. I'm just telling you this was an epiphany to me because it made me understand that when you daisy chain all these computers, just like they daisy chain each of the particle accelerators at CERN that I showed you on Friday, four main accelerators and then a collider, they're doing the same thing with the computers that they're doing with the colliders, and they're interconnected with each other, the collider and the computer. What it means is you now have more than just an 8192 model computer. 
you have all of those qubits working at the same time. That whole list of numbers I showed you, the power of two and all the octaves, if you add all those up, I haven't done it because it just happened this morning. According to Gordy Rose, that's how many dimensions that they're accessing. The 8192 I showed you was an infinite number. There's no end to what they're accessing. So do you think that they have the ability to get information from the other side that's going to help them open this portal? Do you think CERN's going to be successful in opening this portal? Sure looks like it because it says so in the Bible. They will open the doorway to the abyss with the combination of these computers, daisy chain networked together, quantum entangled, and all the colliders and all the power that they have now at CERN. Quantum entanglement was described by Einstein. Again, I'm working backwards. As spooky action at a distance because he could not define or describe what was really happening. He lacked the technology at the time. We call it quantum entanglement because it's two particles and they don't have to be identical. They can be completely dissimilar. But in real time, without time being involved, you affect one and even light years out into the cosmos that quantum entangled pair will communicate with each other in real time. No time delay. It's been described as connecting the two particles with a solid metal rod and then pushing that rod towards one particle or pulling it back. They're already connected. What does it say? What does God say about himself in scripture? I am that I am. There is no time when you're speaking of God and you're speaking of spiritual realms. Nor at the quantum level is time relevant. Time is only a yardstick for our feeble human brains. So I wanted to define quantum entanglement for you so that you understand that these guys are communicating and they can be separated by miles or light years. It's irrelevant. And that's why they're able to communicate to the other side. Because they're entangled with either dissimilar or identical matter and spiritual entities because you cannot separate the physical from the spiritual. So they're getting back energy, they're getting back matter, material, when they open the macro, the macro scale portal, it'll be like a freeway of energy and matter and digitized DNA. So have me come back to DNA. Help me with that because I'll get off track. When the scripture talks about men's hearts will fail for what they behold, and L.A. Marzulli presents things like the fairy and creatures, and they talk about locust armies coming through. This is digitized DNA coming through into our realm. Now, some of the theories say that there are hybrid bodies, bodies that have been created in the laboratory artificially, grown, and that they're in hibernation. Perhaps they'll be indwelt with the DNA as well as the spirits. Some of that may enter into those that are still here, that have accepted the mark of the beast. These things are all tied together. We're about to talk about DNA modification, genetic manipulation. It sounds like Nephilim, doesn't it? The days of Noah. These are the mechanics. These are the tools. This comes from the Tower of Babel which was more spiritually driven than technologically driven. This is Nimrod, who was a chimera. He was mixed, part human, part God, immortal. He modified his own DNA. He literally performed genetic modification on himself. And then God destroyed the Tower of Babel, as we all know, 
And he got angry at God. And he is determined, even today, to kill God and kill God's angels. So he built the technology to achieve that goal. Part of what goes on at CERN is also kinetic energy weapons and directed energy weapons. They've developed what is called strangelets, quark gluon condensate, the most powerful explosive in the known universe. It's a weapons program, not just opening a portal. Nimrod really believes he can kill God. I talk about the hubris of Satan. He's full of himself. He actually, in his deceived mind, believes that he can accomplish this. The Tower of Babel. It really does sound like science fiction and mythology, but this is real. This is what has been dropped on our doorstep. This is the generation. This obviously is the last few days, if you will, of what's going to happen. They're going to achieve this, this goal, not killing God and his angels, but opening this portal. Let's see what we have here for the... Uh, oh, we don't need to see that. You saw that on Friday. Um, okay. It's not usually how I do a presentation in... I think you guys who were here Friday saw it, a nice smooth presentation compared to this today, and I apologize. Um, it's better than a fire alarm. You can go ahead and kill the uh, PowerPoint altogether if you want. 4096, the key to the bottomless pit. Can anyone in here for for my benefit, because I've asked a lot of people that are scholars of the Bible, can you define the key? Can you actually tell me what the key is? Is it a key? What's that? A tone. Absolutely. A wave. A frequency in a wave. Yeah. There you go. It's an encrypted signal. You guys are right on the ball. That's exactly the point that, of realization that I came to. 4096 has huge numbers of translations and ramifications in mythology, in mathematics, geometry, particle physics. My conjecture, can't prove it, 4096 represents the key. That's where I, I thought I was going to stop. But it's 8192. 8192 is the encrypted code. It's an algorithm. 2048, model number, one of the computers, refers to Peter Shore's algorithm called 2048. There's a thing in cryptology of secret encoding for communications called RSA, cryptology. It's based on Peter Shore's 2048 algorithm. One of the benchmarks for D-Wave in building their computers was, can we find all the prime factors in this algorithm? Because Shore said, when he developed it in the early 80s, this theory, that it would take a quantum computer. Now, all he knew about were transistors. He'd never heard of qubits, as far as I can tell. But he said it would take a quantum computer to crunch the numbers, to break the algorithm, to break the RSA coding. Well, D-Wave did. They achieved their benchmark. Okay? They didn't need the 2048 to do it. They did it with the 124 model, one of the Model Ts. And that's when the NSA and everybody got real cozy with them. Because D-Wave started with DARPA funding of $10 million, they realized they were going the wrong direction, so they went and got some venture capital. And they put together first one team, and that didn't work, and then they brought together another team. That's the short thumbnail sketch of D-Wave. But they originated with DARPA. They've always been in bed with DARPA and the NSA. 
They sell their computers to Lockheed and USC. They have an open public quantum computing lab at USC in partnership with Lockheed. Lockheed then bought a Model 12, or 512. NASA, Google, Amazon, uh, the NSA's um, computing centers, data collection centers, like in Utah and Texas, all use D-Wave's computers. But they never talk about networking them. They present it to the public as though they operate independently with independent organizations. So how independent is Google? Okay? That's why this really st stunned me to realize all of these organizations, these corporations, have these computers and they're all working together. So if you follow the money, not just the venture capital that I mentioned, but if you look at the investment publications targeting Silicon Valley and where the money is going, quantum computing, Artificial intelligence from the quantum computing, that's number one. Number two is defeating death, immortality, genetic modification. It's all over in the, in the public domain literature. That's where all the money is going. Jeff Bezos, Amazon, why is he partnered with Google and D-Wave? He's one of the founding partners of D-Wave. Their model their business model at Amazon is they want to sell you everything in the world. We're talking about the beast system. The infrastructure real time exists to control our buying and selling, whether you have the mark of the beast or not. Okay? Now, this computer system also operates in an environment that's called the Sentient World Simulation, SWS. Purdue University published a draft white paper in 2006 describing a sentient world simulation, a mirror, a virtual reality of the entire planet and all its inhabitants. 2007, it went live. If I had my graphics up, I'd show you the progression of the model numbers of the computers coincide with the implementation of the virtual world. D-Wave's computer runs the mirror of the entire planet. The Model 512 in 2013, Gordy Rose described as having the equivalent processing power of seven billion human brains, and each human brain processes a petaflop of data. We can't even imagine the Model T capability. Now we're up to 8192 of qubits and infinite numbers of dimensions. And now processing power, we can't even imagine. This is the beast system. Real time, running since 2007. Every one of us is represented in this simulation as a node in this video with Gordy Rose, he talked about the crossing over, the nexus of parallel dimensions, nodes. And we are each assigned an avatar. That's why the movie was named Avatar. Okay? So all these things connect. Real time, they can monitor us know what we're doing and predict, like future crime, predict what we will do. Because in machine learning you have algorithms that are built based upon human behavior, modeling human behavior for the purpose of predicting what we will do. The machine predicts. If you can predict, you can control. Right? So pebble in the pond, butterfly effect. This is graduate level, right? You guys are still with me. Early benchmark for D-Wave. They said, we're going to test our theory of human behavior, the modeling of it. But we're going to do it with the stock market and the commodities market. 
And what they did was they modeled what was going on throughout the world, environment, economics, civil and military strife, you name it, elections, who's going to win, okay? Is it controlled? Is it a foregone conclusion? Is it a rigged game? You guys answer that. So the benchmark that they achieved was they predicted commodity and stock exchange actions based on our behavior, those algorithms. And they proved that they could predict the market and if they wanted to, they could financially benefit from it. That's part of what these computers can do. That was the first model. That's when they knew they had it, okay? Since then, they've gone to the sentient world simulation. It runs it. It knows what we're doing. This is not paranoia. There's a reason why everything is wired and bugged and tapped into and monitored, because it's feeding the virtual world. All right, you guys have phones. Anybody have the Pokemon Go application? Nobody does it. Good. That is part of the psychological operation which teaches the machine to predict human behavior through building those mathematical algorithms. Pokemon Go is to get people used to living in the virtual reality, in the augmented reality. Re reality, as my third book, Revising Reality, is titled, they're revising reality by getting people comfortable with living in that digital world. I call this our analog, okay? There are reasons why they put these things out. And so they devise the application, and they go, what do you think is going to happen when we drop this into the matrix, the pebble in the pond? They know full well how we're going to respond to it. So how do you beat the game? Some of you guys know the answer from Friday. How do you beat a game? Somebody told me when I asked that question Friday, you got to know the rules. Valid statement. But beyond that, pulling back from it, looking at it objectively and analytically, you say, oh, it's a game. You realize it's a game. Yeah, Pokemon Go is a game. It's a psychological game. It's a psychological operation. They're playing us. We're being gamed. And me personally, when I realize that I'm being gamed, I get a little angry. Mandela Effect, Gordy Rose video, D-Wave. Think what you will about that. I'm not going to defend it, except to perhaps explain it. Why was the physicist in the video from Nicholson 1968 holding a, two signs in his lap. One said Bond 1, the other one said Mandela. That picture is from 2013. And he's laughing, and he's smiling, and he holds up his little paper, and I think it says something like, we're having fun. It's a game. And these characters at CERN and D-Wave know that they're playing a game with us. So Bond 1, you saw early in that video, the original first novel of the Bond series, okay? Casino Royale, it's a game. Monte Carlo is where they played Casino Royale. In statistical analysis in the world of particle physics, there's a thing called the Monte Carlo random number association or prediction. They use it to predict the trajectories of particles that fly off from collisions in the LHC. They're using it to play the psychological game with us, to create the Mandela effect as a psyops so the machine can learn from our reactions and responses. Who's looking at it? who's analyzing it, who's talking about it, who's communicating about it. That's all part of the algorithms of machine learning. That's why the Mandela effect is here. I'll give you the cause of it in a second. 
but they knew that they were going to do a Monte Carlo game at CERN, and they called it Bond One from the movie, from the book. And then they had the Mandela name right underneath it as the application. So, where does the Mandela effect originate from? Would you hazard a guess? D-wave. Other dimensions. I call it quantum pollution. If they, as I said at the beginning, that they are inserting a combinatorial program into other dimensions and extracting 110% more energy than they put in, and Gordy Rose is talking about extracting, re going in and grabbing resources from the other side, that means that there are things, energy, information, digital information, entering into our reality and revising it, polluting it. That's why you see these effects, because it's a game that they designed, and they know full well what it's going to do, and they can predict how we're going to respond to it. You're being gamed. So am I. I'm a pawn in this little game of theirs, just like the rest of you here. Okay? I don't like being gamed. That's why I do this research. I want to know what they're doing. I don't know it all. I have a little slice of what I'm looking at, and I'm looking at it, you know, through the dark glass, the, the dark the glass darkly, as it says in Scripture. I don't see it clearly, but I put on a different set of glasses than most people. I use the Scripture. I use the Holy Spirit for the discernment. That's why last night when I was praying and I went to bed, he said, hey, guess what? You need to show them the 600 model and you need to show them what it relates to the D-Wave and explain all the numbers. You didn't explain the numbers on Friday. Reboot. That wasn't the nefarious NSA doing that. That was God. Now, maybe they were the tool, but who cares? I don't. It's God's plan. He's in control. And then this morning, as I said, he said, no, they're daisy-chained. They're linked. They're all quantum entangled. They're all working together. I mentioned it to Richie, and he goes, oh, yeah, put the phones together and see how well they get along. It's God's sense of humor. I walk in a constant conversation with him, like a lot of you do. You eventually get to that point in your relationship with him. It isn't that you're hearing God audibly, is it? But you know you're walking along, talking with him. And he relates to me through humor. I'm not a humorous guy, you can tell, okay? I'm pretty serious. So he throws British humor at me very dry, very witty, very fast, okay? But that's how he makes me laugh, because you have to be in balance with this stuff. If you're looking at it all the time and you're just going down these rabbit holes and you go, oh, I don't want to see this anymore. I'd rather just go buy a sailboat and go drift on down the river, okay? But he wants me to do this. He commands me to do this. He commands all of us. Because what are we supposed to be doing in our own areas of witnessing? We're commanded to save souls. So what I present is you have a choice. I'm not Pastor Paul. He's much more eloquent. But I simplify it. And I say you have a choice. You go to the light or you go to the dark. There's no in-between, and there's no time to delay that going to Jesus, accepting the Holy Spirit, and getting the full armor of God to protect you. So I haven't forgotten about DNA. The third strand of DNA, our DNA right now can be modified through nanoparticles, nanomachines. We have inhaled through the aerosolized chemtrail spraying through our GMO foods, our environment has polluted us. We have dormant nanocells, nanomachines in our body that will be triggered by microwave impulses. So when people talk about the mark of the beast, accepting it or not accepting it, you have free will. 
If you accept the mark of the beast, the nanoparticles are triggered, your DNA begins to modify in the form of a third strand. We have two strands naturally. A third strand will be developed and it will change your body and it will change your mind. This comes right out of DARPA. I've read the papers. I understand the process. I'm going to look at it and this is, this is utter folly. This is where they're trying to go to for immortality. Dr. Craig Ventner, first person to have his human genome mapped, mapped at Berkeley where I went to school using a particle accelerator, the Advanced Light Source Building. It's a synchrotron ring-based particle collider, the latest model in the advancements of cyclotrons and bevatrons from Dr. Ernest Lawrence at Berkeley. Lawrence Livermore Berkeley Laboratory, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, Berkeley Lab and Livermore Lab, named after him. Livermore is where, among other things, they do the research to develop nuclear warheads. CERN was initiated as an organization for the purpose of modeling nuclear warhead explosions, detonations in the computer. This is a weapons program. They have strangelets that make warheads, nuclear warheads, look like firecrackers in comparison but they use particle accelerators at Berkeley using x-rays, hard x-rays, to infer the structure of DNA and the protein folding of DNA and then the five base chemicals of DNA. And Dr. Ventner took his DNA to Berkeley and said, let's map my DNA. Let's map the human genome. They set up a lab over the hill in Walnut Creek. I grew up in the city of Lafayette. Berkeley, Lafayette, Walnut Creek. Livermore. Okay? Dropped right into the middle of it. That's his sense of humor. Okay? Point is, Dr. Ventner has a laboratory in La Jolla, California called the Institute for Human Longevity. Translation, Immortality. They have what are called sequencers to sequence DNA, tabletop size. They have digitized DNA. Remember I said digital DNA coming through the portal. They digitize DNA into binary code. They transmit it through the cloud and they use a sequencer and the five base chemicals to then reconstitute, to resequence that code of the original source biological DNA transmitted through the cloud, they can grow it at the other location. And this has been going on for at least five years that I know of. Scenario, Mars, Earth, little spaceship. Sequencer, chemicals, shoot it to Mars. Sequencer takes the chemicals, builds the DNA, grows your astronauts. That's why Jeff Bezos is talking about sending nano ships into the cosmos. Okay? All been done, all been proven, all in the public domain, nothing secret that I'm talking about here. Real time today. Nanoparticles, microwaves, sounds bizarre. It's right there in the literature. I'm just sharing it as a reporter with you. So, what do we do with all this? Well, this is evidence and these are facts that you can use to witness to people because there is no more time, right? As I said. And you ask the average person, you've ever heard of CERN? They're going to laugh at you. And maybe they've heard of it and you say, did you know that they're going to open a portal? No. Are you crazy? Do you know that they can grow astronauts from DNA on Mars? Do you know that there's a computer that's artificially intelligent? controlling the world through a virtual reality simulation and that's why we're all being monitored? I won't say it, but you know what I'm thinking. This is real time, so this is information I'm giving you to witness with in the best way that you can take away from this 
because I know this goes right over everybody's head. That doesn't make me special. I've just done the reading. You guys haven't, so it's expected. But your little takeaways, artificially intelligent computers, DNA that's been real-time modified and that's nanoparticles within us, the mark of the beast, the beast system, the infrastructure is there, and the simulation is there. All the components are coalescing. They're all coming together and they're waiting for the restrainer as the trigger to be removed. We that have the Holy Spirit as the full armor of God and the DNA, we're shielded from that. Now, whether we're here or not, I'm not going to debate that. But if we are here and we deny the mark of the beast, my sense in communicating with him is that that literal full armor of God will protect us and shield us from any signal that is broadcast to affect those nanoparticles to affect the changes in our DNA. DNA resonates. It replicates at eight ohms, or ohms, what I'm saying, eight octaves, okay? Same as the Schumann resonant, resonance of the planet, which has been modified as well, okay? So our DNA can be affected by electromagnetic signals, microwaves specifically. They also carry light, they carry energy. They are affected by sound and resonance. Now, there's a lot of things I haven't shared that most of you have probably heard me talk about on various shows. So we've gone to that postgraduate level. This is about as deep as I've gone in my research. It's not for the purpose of fear-mongering and producing fear. This is, should be, for us that are saved, a source of joy, realizing that we are in those last days where things are radically going to change and at least we know what's going to happen to our souls. We may lose our physicality, but we're not going to lose our soul. And if you care about other people, if you have a love for other people, excuse me, go after them. Grab them by the lapel or like I used to do on the streets of Oakland when I'd have somebody who was challenging me and wanted to pick a fight with me when I was a paramedic, I'd say give it one free shot right here, okay? I never took it. Challenge people, get in their face if you care about them. You don't have to remember all the things I'm talking about, but you have an awareness walking out of here that the world, the reality has been revised real time already, okay? So that's my mission, that's my purpose, in the c responding to the command to save souls. I do it with physics. So I'm ready to take questions, if you like. Yes, ma'am. Kind of um, yeah. Um, sure. I'll repeat it so everybody can hear it. So in the scenario of transmitting digital DNA, digitized DNA in the sequencer and the five base chemicals to Mars and then growing your astronauts, do they have consciousness, sentient awareness? Do they have their personality? Do they have memories? Do they have a soul? They'll have everything except the soul is the short answer because everything else can be imparted through digital programming. That's the whole transhumanism discussion of merging man and machine. That's Model T. You don't need to merge a man and a machine anymore. You don't have to be, you know, a Ray Kurzweil who wants to have all of us converted, not us, but the elite, so to speak, through transhumanism to upload our minds, our consciousness, our memories, our self-awareness into a computer. That's old hat. You can do that by programming the third strand of DNA, which is comprised of a nano gold coating, and it receives that digital information, and it's transmitted. Okay? But there won't be a soul. If you want to call it a hybrid, that would probably be a good way of describing it. 
Yes, sir. This is really advanced, he said, and what's the possibility that this could be alien technology? It all is. It's all fallen angel, all derived. And my good friend Richie was telling me the other day, he says, how do you go from transistors and linear progression of more and more, chip, more and more transistors on a chip, Moore's lot, every 18 months doubling the number of transistors? How do you go from that to something that's super cold, super conducting, it's in the form of a qubit that has supersymmetry, superposition. Ones can be ones while they're zeros at the same time and vice versa. And you're talking interdimensionally. How do you get there from 1999 to today? You don't do it in a linear fashion like Intel. You get it from the other side, just like the Nazis did when they had jets and V2 rockets. I'm not being condescending. You and I have had private discussions on this already, and I thank you for sharing the question with the group because we've been able to go through that. But it is definitely alien technology. Is it little green grays and little green men? That's a whole UFO discussion. Are they communicating with the other side and getting information that we're supposed to be restricted by God from knowing about? Absolutely. Okay, lady first. Yes. Sure. Sure. Okay, I'll encapsulate that. Could they clone one man into 666 clones, I think is what you're saying. Go ahead. Well, I didn't say clone. Right. Sure. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. So growing the DNA from the five base chemicals can you create the Antichrist? Can you create the 666? Can you create 666 of them? Uh, sure, that's a scenario that I haven't thought of, but certainly it could be done if they wanted to do it that way. But I believe the beast is going to be grown as a single entity, a single being, if you will. And it'll be programmed, and it'll be artificially intelligent. I believe that all of these work together of the DNA, the quantum computer, and the information coming from the other side to create that beast. Well, it says he's a man. Right. DNA. Yeah. Totally agree with you. Yeah, your talk just blows me away. Well, thank you. I just, I don't want to confuse people. I'm trying to make it clear. Yes, sir. David. Sure. Questions regarding the photographs of what were interpreted as demonic entities or faces in the pipe, in the collider pipe itself, the cross-sectional view of the pipe and a photograph taken. Totally bogus. The reason is, is the physics that are involved. This is a superconducting, super cold, hydrogen-filled, or excuse me, helium-filled environment. This they call it a pipe, the main ring, 27 kilometers in length. You can't put anything in there. It has to be an absolute vacuum, as close as they can get it, sterile environment, because it'll disrupt the trajectory of the particles as they're circulating in the magnetic field that bends them into the curve. So if they were to insert some sort of a camera into that environment, they wouldn't have the particle beams circulating. It would disrupt that. 
Now, conceivably, they could do it without any particles moving through, but that would not produce that type of an image which people have interpreted as the opening of a portal with demons coming through. You can't do that without the energy, and the energy isn't there unless the particles and the magnets are activated. So, in my estimation, it's completely fabricated and is bogus. Let me go to this side of the room real quick. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, the DNA stored in a super cold environment. No. Because what you're looking at are just the five base chemicals that comprise DNA. They don't need to be refrigerated because they're not in a DNA form. So they don't need to be super cold. The super cold is simply so that there is zero resistance in your gold or copper wiring, whatever it may be, so that the electrons can freely flow. So that's the only reason for the temperature. But when you're talking about the third strand of DNA, you have DNA that's growing, but it has nano-thin coating of gold, and the purpose of the gold is so that you can impart digital information on a larger surface area, so you can have more information. But it's information that is not human. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Right. In my example of um, a single tetrahedron as an element, and it's cold, and then you impart energy to increase the temperature, the question is, what temperature is the replication process taking? It's irrelevant what temperature. The moment you begin to impart energy on that at a resting mass, if you will, at a, at a dormant state, it then begins to replicate into more and more tetrahedrons. So it's just a matter of a sliding scale of the temperature. You have a more complex geometric shape. The higher the temperature, the greater the energy. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Mm hmm. Well, each one of the models of D-Wave's um, chipsets, the qubit chipset, has a name. Vesuvius, for example, is one. Um, so when they call it the beast, it may be referring to the chipset or it may just be referring to the enclosure itself and they're just giving it a nickname. But I haven't seen a chipset that is named the beast, only Rainier, things like that, Mount Rainier, Vesuvius, okay? There was a gentleman over here who had a question I kind of ignored. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, what's, what is the qubit made of, the processor made of? Predominantly gold, but also titanium. And a little bit of backstory to the titanium. The discovery of titanium was a relative of Gordy Rose, one of the founders of D-Wave. So titanium and gold is primarily what they use. Okay. Can they oxidize it, make a layer like silicon transistors, or is the whole process Well, what you're referring to is how do they actually build them? And it's a departure from what you would think in terms of transistor development where you're down at the micron level. They actually chose to go to the macro scale using traditional mass production that was developed for the, the transistor gate model industry. They used the macro scale to build qubits rather than going through all the trouble and difficulty to try to build them at the subatomic scale. It was a 
brilliant move. Saved them a lot of development time. Okay, I get one last question I'm being told. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Okay. And so, essentially, in layman's, layman's terms, you're saying the matrix is absolutely real. Let me repeat it for the audience that's streaming. The matrix is real. The matrix is real. Now, uh, along that line, okay, mm -hmm. uh, since we don't really know if there's a red pill, blue pill solution here, okay, Right, okay. which I should have had on Friday. Okay, uh, but, but since we are involuntarily and unwillingly a part of this matrix, uh, you're saying our Faraday cage is the Holy Spirit. The Faraday cage that we have in dwelling within us is the Holy Spirit. Well said. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll take questions after, outside, if you like. Sorry to cut it off. Thank you very much for being so attentive. Thank you very much, Anthony. God bless you.